Members, it is now time for questions to the Minister of Culture, Arts and Leisure. Questions number 7 and 14 have been withdrawn. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number 1, please. I thank the member for his question, and I can confirm that in line with procurement rules and best practice in delivering value for money, all potential providers with the necessary skills and experience will have the opportunity to offer their services in managing or running training programs. This does not apply to the department's own training needs, which are normally serviced through the Centre for Applied Learning, which is part of DFP. In the specific case of suicide awareness, an assessment of the results of a pilot study will take place in due course, and I am therefore unable to give a full report at this point on whether and when a training programme will emerge from this. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, can the Minister give us a clear assurance that further suicide awareness training programmes will be awarded through competition and not given to your next door neighbour, uh, next door to your constituency office virtually, which was the case in September 2013 when PIPs training were awarded £30,000? Um, well, it's a pity that the member has choos chosen to be particularly petty over suicide prevention training programmes. My next door neighbour um, isn't suicide prevention awareness, it's Mrs Kane, just to be factually correct. But, but, Order. but uh, in, Order. in relation to Neve Louise, which is a rural um, suicide prevention awareness programme, and to PIPS training, they were cited because they're working with grassroots groups in the ground. It is a pilot programme. I hope that the results of this, and anecdotally, I've already seen some of the work on the ground um, and heard it across the country, not just in North Belfast, um, that this should be a success. And I hope that that will be reflected in a report. Based on that report, and hopefully on the success that that will highlight, then future programmes, which I hope to bring forward with the support of executive colleagues, will certainly be put out to tender. Order, order. Maeve uh, McLaughlin. I thank the, the Minister's response and, and welcome uh, the Minister and her Department's intervention on a lot of key projects uh, and their impact. Can I ask specifically, going forward, then, will the Minister and her Department fund um, further suicide prevention initiatives, uh, specifically in sport? I thank the member for her question, and it is important that every um, executive member can do their best to support the Minister for Health, Social Services and Public Safety in tackling suicide prevention. It is everyone's business, and sport, but not exclusively, but sport has proven to be one of the most uh, best, or one of the best examples where people are working at, with grassroots groups on the ground to access much-needed services. Um, if funding is committed to the suicide prevention programme in conjunction with Sport NI and others in relation to sport, then certainly post-project evaluation will be carried out. And as a result of that, then we'll certainly bring forward further bids and further examples of where we need to have a joined-up approach. But anecdotally, and as I said, uh, or as I try to say to the, the primary question, anecdotal evidence is that this is the type of work that groups were doing anyway. What it does is gives value and status to the work that they're doing collectively to try and certainly tackle the, the scourge of suicide within our communities. I call Pat Ramsey. Speaker, and could I further to the Minister's responses uh, in terms of is it the most sensitive and emotive subject matter that any community and family can face, the levels of suicide? But would the Minister be mindful that there is a lot of excellent and shining work done by the community and voluntary sector across Northern Ireland and helping to prevent suicide, but also the education of families? Would you remind it in any process going forward that they would be included in any tendering exercises? I totally agree with everything the members had to say, and indeed the member will be aware, even through his own constituency of FOI, that many of these groups do work together and do very, very good work under very, very strenuous circumstances. And most of these organisations are made up of members who have been bereaved through suicide, or indeed made up of family members who are working with relatives who are experiencing poor mental health. So it is imperative that those people are always reflected in anything we do. I'm hoping, and I would anticipate, that the results of this pilot survey will tell us what we already know. 
that we need to do more of this work with groups on the ground. We need to have a better joined up approach across government. And most of all, we need to make sure that people who are furthest away from good access to services are brought right into the middle. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My question follows on from your previous answer um, and reply to Mr. Ramsey uh, again in relation to suicide awareness. And the Minister will be aware of the local, often voluntary organisations, and they play such a pivotal role. I know the case in Bam Ridge Minewise and the work they, that they do for the community. Can I ask then what support will the Minister give to small organisations? or indeed what steps she will take to ensure that they will not be disadvantaged in any way in competing for future funding programmes? Well, I also want to um, support what the member has said about the work of Mindways, particularly as a member will be aware in our libraries, and especially in rural communities. Um, I mean, this, this work was undertaken by both a project that was based in a, an urban area and one that was based in a rural area. And while primarily suicide prevention, um, the main functions are with the Department of Health, Health Social Services and Public Safety. As I've said before, and I'll repeat again, it is everyone's business to try and do something to tackle uh, and to provide opportunities that help better mental health and certainly prevent suicide. So I'm conscious of the volunteer efforts of the families in particular who are involved in these programmes, and I'm also conscious of the fact that this problem doesn't recognise where people live, doesn't recognise postcodes, doesn't recognise class, gender, politics. We all have to do something in the prevention of suicide for our families and our communities. I call William Irwin. Question number two, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for his question. My department through the Arts Council has been able to maintain the level of funding for the musical instruments for band scheme at 200,000 for the last four years. I believe this is a welcome achievement in light of the current economic difficulties and supports the North's long-standing tradition for music making and significant interest of bands here across both and main cultural traditions. Should an opportunity for additional capital become available, I would fully support a case to continue and develop this high-impact program. Increased funding would not, would not only extend its reach but enable the purchase of instruments for brass and accordion bands also, and traditional bands. Music making enhances the social and cultural life of all traditions and as Minister I will support all aspects of music and a wide variety of musical styles including classical, temporary, concert music, opera, jazz and pop. I call William Irwin. I thank the Minister for response. The Minister, I think, will be aware that uh, we know the maximum amount uh, can be drawn down is 5,000 per band. And this can go some way to assist uh, with, for instance, flute bands, but for pipe bands and silver bands and accordion bands, um, it, uh, is not, it's limited in what it could do. Can the Minister look at the, the upper limit uh, for each application? To that. Well, the money is awarded to the Arts Council and they make the decision on what award is given. However, I will take the members' concerns back because I've also had uh, representations from groups who are involved in Irish traditional music. For example, when they're banning um, fiddles or they're banning Ellen Pipes, the, the cost goes into over tens of thousands of pounds on some occasions. Um, so certainly I'm happy to pass on the, the members' concerns to the Arts Council, but certainly can give no guarantee at this stage that that will increase. I call Oliver McMillan. Can I thank the Minister for her extensive answer? Can the Minister confirm if her department supported bans in any other way? Well, the City of Culture included significant involvement of marching bands with a number of events uh, featuring local bands. Um, which added to the 12th of July celebrations as part of a cult cultural programme with partners and stakeholders in the city. And marching bands participated in the Wall City Tattoo, 400th anniversary of the Wall celebration, and in the Flag Hill Naharan, amongst other projects. It is my intention to build upon the success of 2013, particularly in the city and surrounding areas, and I have an executive bid into the, uh, the, the June monitoring round for additional funding to meet this commitment. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Minister, the Irish Council has often been criticised that most of their funding streams is Belfast-centric. Is there any criteria she can ask the Irish Council to put in to make sure that rural bonds are able to avail of this funding as well? 
Well, the Arts Council is criticised for many things, um, uh, and, and most times unfairly, in my opinion. Uh, it's the, the application process is open to everyone, regardless of where they live. Um, it isn't the Arts Council's fault that the demand seems to come from cities more than rural communities. And what I would say to the member is that if there's a demand for bonds within his constituency, then certainly we should encourage him to apply. But there isn't a city-centric approach to funding awards from the Arts Council or indeed any of the other DCAL's arms length bodies. It has been the basis of need and basis certainly of demand in, in this case in terms of rural communities. Moving on, I call Anna Lowe. Question three, please. Thank the member for her question. The storage of locally excavated artefacts is, is a matter in the first instance for the landowners of the sites and where excavations were undertaken in accordance with the historic monuments um, order 1995 and the Environment Agency's licensing procedures. There are no arrangements in place for my department to provide additional storage for objects and, and archives which landowners, developers or commercial archaeologists have not presented to museums for assessment and possible acquisition into its collections. The member will, may be aware that a recent survey commissioned by the Environment Agency, which is responsible for the licensing of all excavations in the North, estimates that over 1,800 archives are held by commercial archaeologists on behalf of developers. These have a volume of 704 cubic metres, which is the equivalent of 10 40-foot shipping containers stored at a range of locations across Ireland. I understand that Minister Durkin has been advised on options for taking this forward, <clears throat> Excuse me, which may lead to an executive paper being presented that will address this, this post-construction boom backlog, backlog and related storage issues. <clears throat> I call Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister uh, for her response. And yes, I have in front of me the survey findings. But um, I would like to point out to in that survey, it also says the limited capacity of museum sector to accept archives and a letter from the Institute of Archaeologists of Ireland, this is not in South, also says that the lack of capacity and the lack of, I need my glasses, uh, that um, there is a lack of properly qualified archaeological uh, curators in museums at both a local and national level. And, and obviously, it points to the fact that we do need more curators in our museums. So what steps um, is the minister going to take uh, to address this deficiency? Well, I thank the member for her question. I haven't been presented by this concern by museums, um, but I'm certainly happy to forward that on. I mean, one of the weaknesses, as the member will be, and as the chair of the Environment Committee, that is a weakness in PP6 in terms of who has responsibility. For, for archives and artefacts and equifacts that have been found. I have no doubt of the skills and expertise of curation within um, museums, but certainly the, I'm hoping that the report, which I haven't seen, will certainly from the working group, which will provide a better way forward, because I think we all share the fear, not only of the potential treasures that have been lost, but certainly those who potentially could be lost in the future, and what we do with those in terms of exhibitions, and what we can learn from those as a society and our communities of things that tell us about our ways in the past and that's something that sits very heavily on a lot of us. So I'm hoping that the Minister for Environment brings forward through the working group a way forward that we all can respond to in a positive way. I call David Hildage. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and I, I do appreciate the, the crossover between departments and appreciate what the Minister has informed the House of today. But has there been any, in her opinion, any assessment by other department uh, of the cost of providing additional storage for artefacts? Um, in fairness to museums, I mean the costs fluctuate depending on the number of artefacts that people say is, are being held by private developers and indeed even by private archaeologists. But even just in the answer to Anna Lowe's, I mean, even just as an estimate at this stage, which kind of averages out at some 1,800 artefacts that have been held, which uh, is in the region of 704 cubic metres, 10 40-foot lorries, that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. I do think that when the Minister, brings, Minister for Environment brings forward the paper from the working group, 
it would certainly bring a bit more emphasis on what we all need to do. And I would anticipate very strongly that on receipt of that paper, the Minister for Environment will be making a bid to the Executive because it will, I uh, have no doubt, entail vast sums of public money to have these, ar ar these archives not only assessed but certainly housed uh, and stored and exhibited. So certainly I'm looking forward to seeing the results of that as well. I call Joe Byrne. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister state if she has had any discussions with her counterpart in the Republic, Minister Dinehan, in relation to having some shared storage facilities for artefacts on a cross-border basis? Well, not in relation to art artefacts. I mean, the situation in the South, the Minister Dinehan and I have discussed the differences, certainly in terms of our legislative approaches. But it's in their legislation that the Minister um, has to have responsibility, both with food, ag and DOE. It is uh, within legislation that guides our departments on what they need to do. It isn't the case with ours. And again, in, in relation to the response to Anna Lowe, I think that's one of the weaknesses of PP6. Um, but certainly, I would anticipate uh, that when Minister Durkham brings forward the paper, he'll certainly highlight some of those weaknesses and certainly highlight some of the gaps. There's no resistance and working across this island between myself and Jimmy Deanhan on this. It's a matter of just getting a legislative framework and indeed the resources there are to do such work in the future. Moving on, I call Trevor Clark. Question number four. I thank the member for his question. DCAL's funding for events is distributed mainly through its arm's length bodies. The Ulster Scots Agency has advised that it provided a total of £9,835.77 in 2011, £8,009.90 in 2012, to groups using the term Orange Fest or similar. There were no awards in 2013. Although outside the period in question, Arts Council provided over £6,000 for Orange Fest at the Spectrum Centre in 2010, again over £6,000 to the Shankill Festival of Culture and Celebration in 2009 and 2010, the member should also note that this information relates only to groups who have used the term Orange Fest or similar, and this therefore may be an underrepresentation of, of the funding position. My department also provides funding to community festivals uh, administered by local councils, and councils have advised that the fund provided over 44, sorry, over 444,000 in 2011 and 2012, uh, and again in 2013-14 which also includes their own match funding, and again this information only relates to groups using the term Orange Fest or similar. I call Trevor Clark. Um, oh, sorry. Um, can I thank the Minister for the answer? I would have to say it is disappointing that so little goes to such a large festival, given that there are 750,000 people annually attend uh, Orange Festivals right across Northern Ireland and 250,000 alone of those in Belfast. But can, and I mean, in terms of a previous answer, the Minister did refer to need and demand. And given I think there is clear evidence here, Minister, that there is a need and a demand for more funding to this, unlike when we look at question six in terms of funding for the Irish language, question, something that was please. actually dying. What assurances can the Minister give that more funding will get, go towards Orange Festivals, given the large amount of people who could become involved in this? Well, the member should be corrected. The Irish language isn't dying. The Irish language is flourishing, which I'm sure the member and his friends are happy to know. In relation to funding for festivals, ensure, ensuring that funding for festivals, obviously the demand is there. It's really up to the groups to lobby their local councils, because my contribution to local councils for festival funding needs to be matched by the council. So if the members aren't really doing their job locally, there's not much I can do about it. I call Rosie McCorley. Um, I thank the Minister for her answers up to this point. And dig Leshinaira Kentu, Mahanig Minu da Fela Oristia Vilforistia, Frij and Kishja Felcha Pubble. Can the Minister confirm if funding for Belfast Orange Fest was awarded through the Community Festivals Fund? Well, as I said previously, DCAL provides community festival funding which district councils administer and match. Any cultural or community group may be eligible to apply. Orange cultural groups can and do receive community festival funding from local councils. 
Belfast City Council has advised the Belfast Orange Fest has not made any application to the Community Festivals Fund, although it is aware of the programme and is included in the relevant circular lists. Belfast City Council did, not make, did make an award to Orange Fest through the Development and Outreach Fund in 2011-2012, the final year of the fund, and this fund was never claimed. I call David McNary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I just asked the Minister, would she agree with me that uh, this money um, has been well spent so far and deserving of uh, appropriate increases? And if she had the ability, would she uh, make a, a bid for those appropriate increases? Well, I agree with the member in terms of festival funding is very, very important, particularly in relation to cultural celebration. Regardless of how we feel about each culture or celebration, it is a very important fund. I would agree that the fund needs to be increased so people celebrating festivals all over can access it. And it's certainly something I'm happy to look at in the future. But certainly for this summer and in the immediate period, I think the level of funding will, will remain as it is. But I am actively looking at how we can increase it because I do believe, particularly in relation to rural communities, but also in relation to communities which are facing particular difficulties around the summer. The festivals are a way in which we can celebrate our culture in a very positive way and a way in which we can hopefully generate the economy so that everyone gets benefit of the festivals rather than people just actually attending the events. Moving on, I call David McElveen. I thank the member for his question. <coughs> My department plays an important role in promoting cultural tourism by providing the cultural activities and facilities which form a vital element to our local tourist product. My officials work closely with key stakeholders on a range of groups across the ECAL family to help promote here as a high quality cultural and tourist destination. In 2013, this year demonstrated our ability to host internationally significant events such as City of Culture, World Place and Fire Games, attracting thousands of visitors here. I am committed to building on the success of the City of Culture with a focus on developing the North West as a driver for the economy and tourism. Culture has a key role to play in many of these events as highlighted by the cultural programme sponsored by my department which ran alongside the World Place and Fire Games last summer. It is important that we showcase our cultural offering to the widest possible audience and therefore will provide further opportunities to do this in the future with the, the return indeed of the tall ships and of the Irish Gulf Open to the north. I call David McElveen. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and I do thank the Minister uh, for her answer. The Minister will be aware that for almost a full year now um, the uh, Ligonel True Blues, Ballysill and LOL and Earl of Erne have been wanting to celebrate their culture in a peaceful and respectful manner by returning um, on their feeder parade from the last year's 12th of July um, celebrations. I wonder would the Minister agree with me that it is very damaging for our tourist product to send out a message that the celebration of culture in Northern Ireland is conditional? I'm not really sure that spending £9 million pounds policing Twidale Avenue is the best example of cultural tourism or the promotion of culture, and I'm sure you would, and I think that's an indictment on people who are not in agreement with you. I think what we need to do is resolve that issue. I find it very saddening and very disappointed that because we as adults can't get our acts together, that we're condemning young people for a life going through the criminal justice system because you are belligerent, you are begrudging, and you won't acknowledge and recognise equality across the board. Order. And I don't think it has anything at all to do with culture. And I only wish you asked a question that would actually promote what we have here to offer instead of using an example which sections one com say the community off against another. Shame on you. I Shame call, on you. I call Cahill O'Hushin. Gorham, I've got a last count of Corey August Boy, I'm Christ of Corey and Ira, if we and a Catholic coach or Gavida is a shade. Could I ask the Minister, is she supportive of the Derry City Council bid for the Irish City of Culture 2016? Gorham August. Given the success of 2013, I'm fully supportive of Derry City Council's bid for the title. I recently met with a range of stakeholders in the city to discuss the bid and Indeed, the city has a strong ambition to become European capital of culture and also to achieve cultural world heritage site status. 
Derry City Council believes that the status associated with becoming Irish City Culture will help achieve these ambitions in the outworking of strategic and collaborative partnerships across the island. And last week I met with Jimmy Dinehan to discuss this for this bid. But I will put the caveat in, while it's, we're very, very supportive of Derry and indeed the North West, we, we certainly can't give a blanket support to providing huge sums of public money without a proper assessment of the needs of the people in that surrounding area and indeed what I'll hope, we all hope to achieve through economic and cultural regeneration. I call Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her answers thus far. Could I ask the Minister what joined up working has our department undertaken with DETI in terms of the using the legacy of recent large sporting events that have taken place here to encourage tourism throughout the North? Well, thank the member for supplementary. Daddy and DECAL, amongst others, are involved in various working groups looking at what we've done well, what we need to do better of, and certainly even with the announcement of the Irish Open and indeed just you know, still basking in the success of the Giro, we can show that even last year, the previous year and this year, and certainly years ahead, that we're trying to do our very best to make sure we bring internationally recognised events and activities here that help promote tourism in a very positive way and make sure that it leaves a legacy that not only are people certainly involved in, in the case of the Giro and more peace and fire games as, as examples, they may be getting involved in physical activity and sport, but certainly that the people who live in, in the towns and villages who haven't really seen the investment that they feel they're entitled to benefit from that. So it's really important that we pull our weights together collectively to make sure we get the best opportunities for here. Moving on, I call Megan Fearon. Question six. I thank the member for a question. Although broadcasting powers remain a reserved matter, I am committed to ensuring that specific characteristics and needs of the North are fully considered in the development of broadcasting policy. I have personally intervened to secure funding from the Department of Cult Culture, Media and Sports for the Irish Language and Ulster Scots Broadcast Funds <laughs> for a further year until the end of March 2016. While this is a welcome move, I will continually and proactively engage with broadcasting agenda with a view to securing a longer term funding commitment from DCMS for these broadcasting funds and indeed at higher levels. I call Megan Furrow. Um, can I ask the Minister what would be the implications of a loss to the Irish language and the Ulster Scots Broadcasting Fund and the implications of that for the sector? There are growing demands for the Irish Language Broadcast Fund and the Ulster Scots Broadcast Fund productions. Um, both from their inception have already achieved audiences that have succeeded their targets, so a loss of funding would have a significant impact on television companies and individuals, including apprenticeships and trainees, and certainly those working in the local production industry. It is estimated that around five million of a turnover would be lost from the overall independent production sector. And furthermore, like television production in Ireland, and remembering that BBC and RTE are largely publicly paid for, the Irish language product production sector is not sustainable without substantial government investment, nor is the Ulster Scots. This would mean that the North would fall behind its Scottish and Welsh counterparts in terms of government funding for Indigenous languages. I call William Humphrey. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in relation to the Ulster Scots Broadcasting Fund, can the Minister assure the House that in terms of programmes and concepts for programming in the future, that there will be consultation with the Ulster Scots Agency, with the Ulster Scots Community Network, and with the Ulster Scots uh, Ministerial Advisory Group, and with the wider Ulster Scots Community, to ensure that the programmes reflect the culture, tradition and heritage out there in the Ulster Scots Community? I can certainly give that commitment. I'm sure the member will agree that certainly programmes have improved over the last recent times. I think we all wanted to see that improvement. Um, and I think the communication and indeed the relationships between NI Screen, the network, the Ultra Scotch Agency and indeed the Magus have improved and improved with local production advice and skills and expertise. And, and I think we already we can see the result of that. And for me it's important that Securing the extra year is a small lifeline for, for these groups, but I intend in the autumn to visit uh, Ed Vesey again and DCMS representatives, but also to uh, meet representatives of all the other political parties in the run-up to the Westminster election to get their commitments that these broadcast funds will endure well beyond the next mandate and even beyond that again, and also to ask for an increase in the money awarded, because I think 
we need to have a better uh, support and better investment in our broadcast funds. And that is the end to the list of oral questions to the Minister. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if she will continue to help and provide um, sporting facilities for the local community uh, on the Cumber Road site in Yutonards, uh, run by and organised by the Regent High School? Please. Well, I'm not familiar with the project, although I am familiar with the member's um, representation for his constituency in the Arts Peninsula. Um, but certainly, I'm not familiar with the facilities, but I would say this. See, particularly in rural areas, where there's very little in some of the communities. In fact, some of the sporting uh, facilities are the community. And it is important that that support is continued. And I would expect the member to make representation through the Sport NI to have not only whatever investment is there continued, but certainly to have it strengthened and secured. Um, but I'm happy, happy to take uh, any details from the member and pass them on to Sport NI. I call Kieran McCarthy for supplementary. Yeah, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm very grateful to the Minister, and I would very much like to see the Minister join me uh, on a tour, and I could certainly show her what is required. But um, could I pass on uh, the Regent House comments, uh, thanks to the Sport NI, yeah, Sport NI for the wonderful uh, providing of funding for the uh, hockey pitches that was being officially opened this morning. And, um, Can we have a the, question, please? On the back of that, these, these, these uh, sites on the Cumber Road have been uh, vacant for some Excuse time. Excuse me. Order. And we Can need we to order. Can we have a question, please? I'm asking the Minister if she will make sure that there will be no further delay in the provision of the uh, Cumber Road sites in Yutonards. Well, in respect to the member, what I will do, I will raise this concern with Sport NI to ensure that there are no unnecessary delays. I can't, as a member, will appreciate, give a commitment that that won't be the case just from this dispatch box. I don't think the member would expect me to say it, but I'm happy to raise those comments and those issues with Sport NI, and I'll correspond with them accordingly. Moving on, I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update? Uh, on progress of funding for the sub-regional stadia for such clubs as Bangor Football Club and other football clubs throughout Northern Ireland who have long awaited for such funding? Well, the sub-regional, as a member may be aware, again, he may not be, um, the sub-regional programme wasn't due to start until 2015, but already I've started the process within a department uh, in terms of getting staff organised uh, because hopefully we'll have Case and Park on board soon. Um, what we need to have is our seamless links between the, the stadia development and the sub regional. I'm working very closely with the IFA in terms of facilities management. And on the basis of that, uh, and indeed a confirmation of the budget, uh, I'm certainly uh, happy to take representation from the member about clubs in his constituency. I call Gordon Dunn. I thank the Minister for her answer, but can the Minister clarify that she has bid for such funding? I understand she has made preparation. I did say Bangor Football Club, just for clarity. <coughs> I'm aware of Bangor Football Club, particularly through the work of Ollie Season and Furness to him. Um, it is the first time I've ever raised Bangor Football Club, but I'm sure you're, you've, got, you've got with the programme, as I say. Uh, in relation to making bids, it's not appropriate for me to make bids at this stage. It will be appropriate for me to make bids in the autumn in preparation for 2015. And on the basis of that, I'll bring that information forward to the member if he wishes to write. I call Michaela Boyne. Gormavit, uh, Kim Colia, can I ask the minister if she could give an update to the House and the City of Culture legacy for the plan for the North West, um, The City of Culture legacy, at the minute we have a bid and with the June monitoring round, we're waiting the outcome of that. But already, um, I know that the member will probably, or probably will, or, and has raised the issue of Straban and other parts of the North West. Uh, and certainly discussions with city councils and shadow councils and local councils at this stage are ongoing, indeed with groups in the area. So we're just waiting on the outcome of those bids. I call Michaela Boyle for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her response? And can I further ask the Minister, can she ensure or give insurances that the shadow council will be represented? Uh, when proposals for the North West legacy are being discussed and brought forward, Gormagut? I can't give that member I can't give the member that assurance and indeed I'm happy and have met with her and others from the surrounding areas to ensure that yes, 
the bid for Derry is supportive, but that the dairies in the North West are included, and it is very important, particularly for Stavon, that they are represented in any future funding or any future investment. I call Maeve McLaughlin. Um, and the Minister, in a, a previous question, outlined the importance of securing uh, the Irish language and Ulster Scots broadcast funds. Uh, could she maybe outline how broadcasting in general uh, will have better security here in the North? Um, in relation to broadcasting in general, as uh, in also to the Ulster Scots and Irish language broadcast funds, it is very important that we have the same investment that has been enjoyed by certain Scotland and Wales in relation to government investment. I will be making that case to counterparts in DCMS and indeed other political parties, the representatives around culture and media and sport, <laughs> because broadcasting here relies very much on local commissioning, local production, and local people who are involved in this industry feel, uh, certainly the ones that I've talked to and looking far and wide, that they're not getting a fair share. So it is important that we look at investment in broadcasting, but particularly in relation to protecting the Irish language and also Scots broadcast funds. I call Mayor McLaughlin for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her response uh, and I urge the Minister to continue her efforts uh, to provide better opportunities for all involved in, in broadcasting and I think particularly for local students and trainees and, and quite often for local companies to get greater commissioning opportunities. I certainly will um, and as I said to the member previously, um, the best way in which we can do that is to make sure that all the representatives of the political parties uh, certainly before the next Westminster election, have made commitments uh, to this investment continuing, but certainly increasing. And that isn't just for the broadcast ones, that's for broadcast in general as well. I call Robin Swan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, I think you're well aware that next year celebrates the 700th anniversary of the landing of Edward the Bruce in Ulster and his subsequent campaign. Can you give the House an update of the support the Department's given for the celebration of that anniversary? Well, certainly, um, I'm happy to write to the member. I have no details of any specific celebrations. I'm aware that certain areas, particularly within the North Antrim, have muted, if not cited, or dictated that they tend to apply to arts councils and to local councils to get support for it. I'm very supportive of this because, at the end of the day, this is about making sure that people who celebrate anniversaries that don't fall within the decade of centenaries have an opportunity to apply to the community festivals funds, as an example, but also have an opportunity to apply and work with libraries, work with PRONI, and work with other arms length bodies within DECAL to ensure that we provide as much of a cultural package as possible to help people in those celebrations. I call Robin Swan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for, for her support. Would you be able to make any resource available, any other department of officials available to the new Super Council in Midden East Dundrum? Council, which will be celebrating are the main attraction for the Bruce anniversaries? Well, I, I would anticipate that if the councils and shadow councils haven't already spoke to either Arts Council or any of the decal officials or its arms length bodies, they will certainly do so after today's question time, led by the member. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what contribution will our department be making to the Milk Cup? Well, certainly, um, I was annoyed at the way in which the milk and the foil cups were, pardon the pun, kicked back and forth from one department to another uh, in previous years. I made the decision to give money to the foil and milk cups. I've made a bid to do so again this year. I'm still waiting on representation coming from the organisers uh, for meetings to see how we can take this forward on a longer term basis. I'm aware that the Daddy Minister has also been very, very supportive as well. And it is important that we do better long-term planning, particularly around sustainability of these competitions. I call William Irwin. Uh, thank you. I'm going to thank the Minister for her response. Uh, the Minister will no doubt be aware of the success of this annual festival of football, its impact on tourism and the opportunities it creates for young boys to participate in a world, world-class event. Will she commit to this house uh, to assist the organisers in the future events? Yeah. Well, I would support the member's comments on the status of the, the Milk Cup competition. I mean, like football legends have said that the Milk Cup has been an example of what to do and what to do best, certainly for people involved in junior soccer. But as I said, the member, I have made a bid. I am keen to try and make sure that there is investment this year and indeed for future years. 
and I know the Delhi Minister has the same appetite to try and do something more on a longer term basis. Um, so to that end, I'm waiting on the outcome of the monitoring rounds, but I'm also trying to work with organisers, three officials, or Sport NI, or both, to try and get a better sustainability and projections for the competitions in the future. Anna Lowe is not in her place. I call Jerry Kelly. I wonder would the Minister be able to give any updates on the TBOC proposals for sports facilities and services at the uh, Goodwood site, please? Um, I thank the member for his question. At the minute, the executive are considering papers uh, in relation to the TBOC proposals. Certainly, Girdwood is one of the examples where working collectively with other ministerial colleagues and indeed other bodies such as Belfast City Council, but also in terms of Sport NI and the Sports Institute. It's one of the best examples that we can all pool our efforts and our resources collectively to have a better impression of together building United Communities principles and what they look like. And it's also very good in terms of children and young people who haven't followed the academic route, but particularly want to go down the vocational route for acquiring skills and opportunities and expertise around sports. I call Jerry Kelly for supplementary. Congratulations, It was going for this lesson I had on Friday with this show. I wonder if the minister maybe uh, elaborate a wee bit on what Sport NI and other stakeholders, um, what their role might be in the development and delivery of uh, services in the, on the site and other opportunities. Um, I'm happy to do that. The Sport NI um, have, have been practicing in sporting programs for many years, as a member will be aware, and collectively with the Sports Institute and indeed working with the community groups and the sports organisations and universities, along with DECAL and hopefully the Department of Social Development, what they'll be able to do are target particularly vulnerable young people or young people, children young people who have been hard to reach, who have been working with groups particularly on a voluntary basis for many a year, who want to have a career and, and who also need to get employment in this field. And with that wraparound support, hopefully they'll have better qualifications and accreditations that will steer them in the future. Apart from anything else, it is a site that has been earmarked for development, and there's no better legacy for an example of ongoing regeneration than a site that's used 24-7, and particularly if it's floodlit and youngsters are playing sport. Jim Wells is not in his place. <clears throat> and that ends question time for today.